I kind of sprung that on him this morning, so he's pulling double duty. And I really appreciate him. I don't know if y'all know how much. Good young man. But if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. And there is a uh, parallel uh, version of the story of Mark, chapter 10, which we'll refer to, but you don't have to turn there. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about a subject, and I'll go ahead and be up front with you. I have no agenda whatsoever uh, when, when I begin talking about certain things. I don't, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not smart enough to come with an agenda. If the Spirit of God don't lead, we don't get. I'll just go ahead and tell you right now. So as, as I had posted on Facebook, and of course, you know, when I look around this morning, I start scratching my head going, maybe I should have kept that one to myself. Because this morning we're going to be talking about Jesus' thoughts on divorce. And, and you know, really, that's just a play on words because the story today, what we're going to find out is, is Jesus really does not show as much concern about divorce as he does something else, okay, in this story. So as I start today, please, we can debate if you'd like to about whether this is uh, the chronology where it should be. I'll go ahead and tell you I have to use several different sources. I get the best consensus I can. And this, this is where my general consensus comes, where this story falls. Remember, Jesus has been about doing it. He is in the final months of his earthly ministry. All right. But I also want to tell you, because I got it in my notes right here, and I don't want to forget. Um, today is one of those days where I have to confess to you, kind of like I told them on Wednesday night a few weeks ago about certain issues. This is where a degree or a doctor of some type might, might, would give me a little more confidence. If I had some what most people call proper training, I might would feel a little more confident, maybe some proper education. Um, because sometimes there's some certain subjects I'm not near as confident from the pulpit as I should be now. In one-on-one -on -one conversation, it's a little different. Because I can look them in the face and they can understand that I'm being very, very sincere when I'm talking to them. And some people hear me from the pulpit and think that I'm angry, but no, it's not anger at all, it's passion. But now, let, let me just say this. Uh, if I could be more confident, uh, it would be better for you. But today we're going to rely on the anointing. But as we approach this story, remember Jesus' enemies were using this topic of divorce as a, as a way to divide. Or they were trying to be divisive. They were trying to, to stir up a debate. You know, in that day, there was, there was a debate about divorce and remarriage. And I'll be honest with you, it is no less divisive today it stirs up even greater debates. So with that in mind, just remember, everything I tell you today, I want it to be from the Bible and the Bible alone. You see, because really, I don't, I don't have but a couple things going for me. I do have a VA, born again. Okay? I have an HGP. That means I'm Holy Ghost baptized. And as Logan's first grade or second grade teacher says, I'm all about fraud. I'm fully relying on God today for a word. And for any knowledge, any understanding that I might have or we might impart and get gather together, it's going to have to come from Him. Okay? Right. But, but now then, so having all that in mind, I'm not going to bother you with statistics and studies and what are called peer review articles because there's plenty out there. I can start telling you all the statistics and depending on how they have leaned the the, the questionnaires and things, I mean, they show that divorce is just as rampant in the church as it is in the world, but I can tell you that's not the case. They just say it because they want to believe that. All right, but they also can, can tell you different things about the statistics, and I can tell you, because of the people I know, the experiences I've had being around people, who have gone through divorce and worked through divorce. I mean, look, there's, I mean, we could talk about all the bad you wanted to. But rather than doing all that, why don't we look at what the Bible says? And let's see what Jesus really thought about divorce. See, now, in this story, in Matthew chapter 19, it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, 
he departed from Galilee and came unto the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, saying unto him, Is it lawful for man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that which that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. And, he, and said, For this cause shall man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And I say, Amen. <clears throat> they say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put, a, put her away? And he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except, for, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. And that's where we're going to stop, and we'll see how far we get. I want to just point out, number one, it, as we see Jesus in the final months of his earthly ministry, I want you to notice one thing. He has not stopped doing what he does. He's moving about. He is working his way to Jerusalem. And in the midst of growing opposition, in the midst of hard teachings, because Jesus does not hold back. He does not sugarcoat the message. He, it, honestly, to, to quote Ben Shapiro, facts don't care about your feelings. Guess what? The truth does not care about your feelings. The truth is the truth. But see now, as Jesus is going about, there are still multitudes who follow him. I mean, he has, he has made the proclamation after he had gotten a crowd so large. One time he says, it's time to divide the herd. If you're going to follow me, you must be prepared to come and die. And as a bunch of folks said, 10 more, Jesus, we enjoyed it up till now. See you on the next one. Uh, yes, sir. There were many of them that heard him say, if you're going to follow me, you must take up your cross daily. Amen. Take it up daily. Not, not every once in a while, not on Sunday mornings, but every day, take up that cross. Now, even in that, they are following him. Why? Because they need him. You know, even because this is his final months, Jesus has his suffering on his mind. The work on the cross is in his mind. And, and as it approaches, Jesus is still doing what he does. He is preaching, teaching, and he is healing those that need it. Amen. Up until his last breath, Jesus was about his father's business and he was about fulfilling his destiny. But his destiny, of course, is wrapped up and defined by his anointing. Luke 4, 18 and 19 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, this is Jesus speaking, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That is his anointing, that is his destiny, and Jesus does it right up until they crucify him and he draws his last breath. Because the last thing he says, he preaches what is the acceptable year of the Lord. Y'all know what that is? The greatest words that we can ever hear. It is finished. The debt has been paid. That is the acceptable year of the Lord today, man. But now Jesus is trying to keep things a little low key, and he's in this setting. And here comes another group of Pharisees to Jesus. Every time you turn around, I'm starting to think Jesus should have stopped, should have stopped turning around because every time he turned around, there was another group of Pharisees with a question. And they never come to him with an honest question. They come to him trying, as it says here, to put him to the test. They want to tempt him. They, they want to cause him to have a missed 
misstep or stumble in his teaching, so they have a reason to accuse him. And verse 3 says they bring a legal question to him. They say, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Let's put it this way, just so, because it helps me understand. They ask him, Jesus, is it lawful? Is it legal? In our day, we would, we would skip over the legal part. What we would want to know is, is it socially acceptable? Is it a cultural norm? Is it okay for a man to divorce his wife, his current wife, for any cause, for any reason? That's a question going around today. God rest his soul, but Ronald Reagan will tell you the worst decision he ever made was signing a law while he was governor in California of something called no-fault divorce. Somebody's always at fault. It may be both of them. Maybe the devil. Somebody's at fault. In Mark chapter 10, verse 2, it's, it's the same thing, and it tells us that they ask with the intent of tempting Jesus. Because you know what? Religious people, when they bring up divisive subjects, when they bring up, as Paul calls it, contentious items, they're not really looking for an answer. They really don't care what Jesus thinks. They just hope to catch him in an off moment, have something to accuse him of as if they needed a quote-unquote real reason to accuse Jesus. They accused him just in their questioning. Who do you think you are? And as always, Jesus does not give them what they want. See, what they would have preferred is for Jesus to go, sure, it's lawful. Ha ha, ha ha, so you, you, you go against God's command that says that he hates divorce. That's not what I said. But if he says, no, so you're telling us that a man is shackled to some old hag for the rest of his life, even if, even for any reason? How dare you? No, oh, man, Jesus just ain't going, he ain't going into the trap. Because that's not really the point of the question. Jesus does not give them what they want, but what he does give is what he gives us. He gives us what's needed. He gives us what's best. And just like every other time the Pharisees come to attack, when the devil comes to attack you, guess what? It's a teachable moment. There is something in here that can be learned. So Jesus now, instead of giving them a yes or no clear-cut answer, he asked them a biblical question. They said, they said is it lawful? Hmm? Is it lawful? We've read the law, so apparently... They think it is okay, but we want to see what you think, Jesus. So Jesus, in the custom of the day, asked them a question, but he questions their biblical knowledge. He says, have you not read? Have you not read? See, that is a very simple question. When somebody comes to you and asks you a contentious question, let's say about homosexuality, and they go, do you really think God says, have you read the Bible? Have you studied out? Before you come asking me my opinion, tell me what you know. You're going to find out that they're more ignorant than you think. What they've done is they took a sound of what would he call a talking point from television. And because it's a cultural norm, they just followed in a line lockstep because they don't want to think for themselves and believe the truth. See, see, now look, this is uh, one of those passages that will get you into deep trouble in some of our more progressive nations. You head a little further north and you preach this right here and they'll lock you up. See, their attitude is, is that when we begin to tell them that here's what the Bible says, Jesus says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Who do you think you are to tell us that marriage is between a man and a woman? Because he goes on, he says, and said, for this cause shall man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they shall twain be one flesh, wherefore... 
They are no more twain, but one flesh. How dare you? See, Jesus doesn't even talk to them about divorce. He talks to them about marriage. You see, when, when somebody approaches me, this is honestly, the, the Lord has used this in my life because I've had people, and they'll come and just begin to tell me how horrible their spouse is. And how they're contemplating divorce. You know what I do? I refuse to talk about divorce, but I talk about marriage. Talk about what are you doing in your marriage? You're telling me how horrible she, she is, because it's almost always a man. I said, let me ask you something. Is she your wife or is she old, is she your old lady? And that right there usually shuts the conversation down. Because if she's your old lady, that tells me all I need to know. That tells me what you truly think of her. That was free. That's not even in that. You see, Jesus describes uh, by biblical reference the biblical definition of marriage. One man, one woman for life. But then he also paints a vivid picture for his listeners to see. Get, get a picture in your mind. A man is to do two things. He is to leave and cleave. You see, what, what that picture is, is the people hear him. He is to leave the covering. He is to leave the protection. And he is to leave the provision of father and mother so that he can have the ability to cleave to his wife. You see, th this is about position. He moves out from under a covering so that he can become a covering. You see, he is now the covering for his wife and for his family. But he can't do that if he is... Look here, man. Have you ever seen somebody try to, try to work two umbrellas? It don't work. Huh? You ever seen somebody open one umbrella and another one try to stick one up? It don't work. You have got to move out from under that covering and get under your covering. You see, men that are hanging on to that old life will never truly cleave to their wife. That's why it hurts mamas and daddies' feelings a lot of times because if a man does it right, if they don't have an understanding, they'll get upset that he seems to be turning all of his attention to the wife. Well, that's what he's supposed to do because he has now got a job to do. He is now the overseer and the covering. He has to be the head of the family and he cleaves to her as her covering, her protector, and her provider. That's not to say it's not a team effort. I'm just telling you. That is the picture Jesus paints. And, it, and he says, look, they are joined together. Let me go ahead and tell you, that is not just physically. That is emotionally. That is spiritually. See, they are more than partners. Okay, They are more than partners in a covenant. But rather, they are one by a covenant. Y'all get that, man? They're more than just a partner in a covenant with you. But rather, y'all too have become one by the covenant of marriage. It is a transitional thing. That's why men and women who stay married a long time start to look like each other, sound like each other, talk like each other. I find it quite comical when Tina starts using construction language around people. It is awesome. Huh? She does it, man. Boom up, son. Huh? Yes, sir. We ain't gonna, we ain't gonna talk no more about that. She'll, she'll be embarrassed. You see, this is, of course, why when, when the church is spoken of by way of relationship to Jesus, it is as the, the husband and the bride. You see, we are not partners with Jesus Christ, but rather we have been bought with a price, grafted in by His covenant, sealed in His blood. That is, that is how it works. You see, Jesus has told them, them, He has told them God's ideal. This is God's best. 
Here's some things about marriage I want you to keep in mind. Number one, it is God's idea and it is God's institution. Marriage and family are God's idea. Okay? But not only that, it is God's plan to fill the earth. But now then, because it is God's best, where do things go wrong? Well, let's, let's pay attention to what Jesus says because they come to him and he says, Wherefore, or what wherefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. God's intent was never that men and women get divorced. I said that's his intent. That's his best. That is his perfect will for humanity. One man, one woman, till death do us part. No condemnation. I'm just telling you that is God's plan. That is what he would prefer. Verse 7, now listen to their rebut. They say, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Good question. Why did he? Listen to that stupid question now. You see, that they have done something that a lot of people in the world do. They have misrepresented a command of God. They have misrepresented the divorce decree made in the law. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Let's see what Moses said. Let's see what God says through Moses about getting a divorce. Because y'all do understand that because there are men involved and women involved, sinful people involved, and the devil is at work on this planet, divorce going to happen. I didn't say it was good, didn't say it was right, I'm just telling you it happens. Deuteronomy chapter 24, starting with verse 1, says, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Stop there. You can carry on through 1 through 4 if you'd like. You see, the question that the Pharisees ask, is it okay, is it lawful to divorce her for every and any reason? And they said, why did Moses say give her a divorce decree? See, they're, they're not even playing the same game. They're moving the goalpost now. For any reason, but Moses said that we ought to give her a bill of divorcement. Hmm. You see, Jesus referred them to Moses because Moses is their authority in their mind. And they try to tell Jesus that Moses commanded divorce. Is that what Moses commanded? Not at all. No, he didn't command divorce. See, what these men were doing, I know y'all going to find it's hard to believe that, that good so-called religious men would do something so unseemly as what these men are doing. Y'all gonna have to pardon my, my crudeness, but I am a bit like 80 grit sandpaper most of the time, but it's just the way I am. These men had figured out and circumvented the law of God. They had used a command, the permissive will of God, as an excuse to whore around. That is all they're talking about. What do you mean? These men were using divorce as a way to have multiple wives. And see, what, what they had decided is, is that, well, in our culture, polygamy is looked down on now. Although God allowed it for a time, it's just not socially acceptable. And to be honest with you, it's very expensive. I've told y'all, man, you got them television shows and people want more than one wife and, and, and them on Wednesday nights heard me say it more than once. Would y'all like to know what that's all about? That's dumb. Please hear me. That is dumb. God allowed it for the protection of women for a time because there was more women than men, but it never turns out good. It is dumb. Amen. 
and it's expensive. So what these men would do because they were they were money hungry and they like to pinch pennies is they'd get their wife and, and they would enjoy that for a while, but then they'd see something better because you know the grass is always greener, even though they forget that it's still gotta be mowed and it's still grass. They would divorce the one so they could go have another. And when they got tired of her, they'd divorce her and go back if that's what they wanted to do. But the Bible is explicit, it says, do not do that. But in their mind, what they were doing was, is they were using one sin, listen to this, to avoid sinful behavior. Huh? What do you mean? They were misusing and abusing other people to, in their mind, avoid adultery and fornication. Hey, because if I'm divorced from her, and married to her, then it's okay. I believe that the Savior's face is probably ashen white and angry, angry at the moment. You see, they had taken advantage of women who in that culture, I mean, it's foreign to us to think that someone has no rights. But in that culture and in that day, women had no rights. And you listen, mankind is sinful and evil. So their question was, is it okay to divorce for any reason? Maybe she's not as pretty as she was. Maybe, maybe she can't cook. Maybe she's just cold. I mean, honestly, pick a reason. That's all they're trying to say is, can we just divorce because we want to? Maybe she cut her hair, I don't like it. see what has happened is they've decided that what I'm going to do is, is we will develop a system where we can give her a divorce paper and move on to the next victim. And we'll do it in the name of the law. Hmm. Well, let me ask you this. Have you given any thought to why it says that Moses said it's okay to give him a bill of divorce? Well, it was for her protection. Honestly, the only reason God allowed this quote-unquote written piece of paper was that she had evidence, she had proof that she had been released from this other marriage. Because without it, she was sure to die. Y'all remember the, the, the woman at the well? I, I re-listened to that message on occasion because I like it. Jesus comes to the well He's sitting there and here comes this woman in the heat of the day. Ain't nobody with her because she is living a life of shame and it says she's been married five times. And the man she lives with now ain't her husband. And I make a comment in that message that shocks myself. Because there's nowhere in the story does it say this woman who has been married five times was the cause of any of those divorces. There's nothing in there that says that she wasn't a widow five times. Her sin is the fact that she is now shacking up with a man. That's the sin. Because even if she had been divorced five times, in that culture she had no right, no authority to even instigate a divorce. She would have absolutely been a victim on every one. Why did Jesus show her so much compassion? Because Jesus reaches out and gives grace to the humble. Amen. So now listen to verse 8. Jesus corrects their understanding, which is what we need a lot of. Lord, correct our understanding. Because it says, He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. what Jesus has done is he has talked to them about the importance and the value of marriage, not about divorce. And now he, he corrects their understanding. He says Moses gave the command to write the divorce paper for the sake of the woman. He said it helped her avoid a life of prostitution or servitude. And he says the reason Moses did it was not as a command from God 
because he loves divorce, but because you are a bunch of hard-hearted people. God allowed it, but it's not his best. God does not approve of divorce, but he knows that it is an absolute necessity in certain cases. Divorce is never commanded in the Bible. But because people and men and women can and will still be unfaithful, they'll be mean, they'll be uh, hateful, they'll be unreconcilable, unreasonable, and just plain sinful. Divorce is going to happen, I hate to tell you. But it's not God's best. God's best is to get married and stay married. Tough it out if that's what you think you need to do. You see, every once in a while, I told you, man, I get, get them discussions going on and somebody, oh, they start telling me how bad everything is and I immediately tell them and they normally stop wanting to talk to me. I tell them, look, man, I will never counsel you to get a divorce. Amen. Never will. I may tell you, especially in certain circumstances where there's abuse going on, you need to separate for a while. There's absolutely nothing wrong, and it's absolutely biblical sometimes that you and your spouse get some time apart, because especially in the cases of abuse, because if she'll abuse you, man, she'll abuse your kids, and woman, guess what? If he'll abuse you, he'll abuse anybody and your children. You may need to get them kids. You may need to get the kids and go away until they have some help and some reconciliation. Hey, I tell you what. You may have to go away until he gets saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and delivered from that demon of hate and abuse. You may have to do that. But in the meantime, I, if you're asking me, I'm going to tell you, you need to pray, and you need to be faithful as best you can. See, because at the end of the day, I want God's best. I don't want what he permits. I want what's best for you and for anybody else. You see, because reconciliation is what brings God the most glory. And if you don't believe that, if your homework is read the book of Hosea. I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, that is a hard first four chapters. Because hey, hey, everybody in there know how it goes in Hosea? Hosea is commanded to marry an unfaithful woman. And he does. And he loves her. How do you know he loves her? Because he has several kids by her. You can't, you can't tell me you don't love her and have kids by her. Sorry, don't work. But then she plays the harlot and goes away. And Hosea's thinking, I'm done with this. And the word of the Lord comes to him and says, you go buy her back. You restore her unto your house. Do it now. And it says Hosea does. You see, it is out of that story that we see God's faithfulness to his people Israel, but it is also in that story that we see the love and the grace that he shows towards us in that in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He come down when I was the most unfaithful to him. He came and died for me anyway. You see, the key is, but that was not God's intention for marriage. No condemnation, I promise you. That's just God's heart in the matter. In it to win. Amen. Then verse 9, he, he gives us what I would call the legitimate, the legitimate reason to divorce when you're talking about believers. Now why would I say that? Because unbelievers do not fall under the law. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. They don't receive it, they don't trust it, and they don't care. So if you're a believer, verse 9 says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. Who is he speaking to? Men is who he's speaking to. And he says, And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. God's standard is high. Jesus is not saying that you have to get a divorce in the case of unfaithfulness. He's just saying, if you can't get over it, if you can't work it out, that is your only legitimate reason to divorce as a believer. Because at the end of the day, there's nothing unforgivable except for blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. You see, 
And then, of course, we get into a big debate in the church nowadays because uh, we have a tendency, we get started preaching about marriage, and I hold marriage in very high regard. Because I start when they're young and start telling man, you need to you find your wife, man. Go find a girlfriend. That's dumb. Find you a wife. Find you somebody that you can covenant with and go through life together. That's not, that's I'm just telling you, man, that is God's best. And then there are those who, who now will jump right into another contentious debate and, and in the church. We don't seem to get our, our feathers ruffled over divorce, but you know what you'll get folks fighting mad about? Remarriage. Remarriage. They go, oh, you just don't understand. I, I do understand. That's the thing. I do understand. I understand that the Bible speaks expressly and directly to those who have been married and widowed and divorced. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I don't know if y'all realize or not, Apostle Paul didn't play the radio. Huh? Apostle Paul didn't hold anything back. Apostle Paul talked about anything and everything with anybody that it was appropriate to. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says, Now concerning things whereof I wrote, or unto you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman her own husband. Okay? That is just not hard to understand. Paul says, look here, man, if you can live a celibate lifestyle, go ahead. Man, I believe that's best for, for everybody. But it's just not realistic. Because there's, we're wired in such a way that we've got hormones and different chemicals in our body that make us, it'll make you crazy, I'm told. Paul says, look, if you can't live a celibate lifestyle, get married and stay married. Pretty simple. Who was he speaking to there? Anybody and everybody that would listen and read the Bible. All right, moving on quickly because I want to wrap up today. See, now, Jesus' teachable moment has revealed another aspect of what I call a religious spirit. It is a legalistic attitude that surrounded even the Pharisees. They were proud of their sin. They, they were absolutely proud that they were in their mind upholding the law. They were justified in it by the law. Just like our culture today that invites and demands us to celebrate sin. It's that same spirit. Same spirit that surrounds homosexuality, sexual immorality, and blasphemy. They no longer hide it, they revel in it. They don't, they, don't, they don't need ridicule, hear me today. They need the gospel, which is the power of God and the salvation preached unto them. They need the Spirit of God to use the law of God to reveal their sinful nature to them that they might be saved. The disciples' reaction is quite comical if you read on in verse 10 because they go, well, Jesus... In that case, we're going to just presume that you're trying to tell us it'd be best if we didn't get married. This is coming from men that are already married. A lot of them. See, it puts a smile on my face. Because these are men who hear Jesus speak of the value of marriage. And say, well, if it's that hard, Maybe we shouldn't get married. And y'all know what I say about that, don't you? Huh? How did, how did they get that from that? Well, because they're, they're short-sighted. They are hung up on the debate, which is it okay to get divorced? And, and Jesus is not even talking about divorce. He spends his time talking about the value of marriage. Stop worrying about if divorce is right or wrong and focus on how good marriage is and is supposed to be. And divorce goes away. See, Jesus is not trying to discourage 
together. On, uh, marriage, on, uh, on the contrary, he is emphasizing how much value God puts on it. You see, and of course, the, his response in verse 11 says, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. Not the message about marriage, but the message about not being married. I want to take just a minute. You know, there's this large denomination we don't associate with. Matter of fact, they would call us uh, Protestants, and they're not. They're, they are overrun with homosexuality in their leadership. Can I tell you today that what would fix it and what would need to be implemented today is what Jesus says here. Not everybody can stay celibate, dummies. Not everybody was meant to be single for a lifetime. Verse 12, he says, For there are some eunuchs which were born that way. In other words, they can be that way because that's the way they were born. And some take a vow and become eunuchs. There are some that just can't receive that. See, this particular church, as a body, Needs to implement having married priests and married leadership. Because the Bible nowhere, anywhere says that the men and ministers of God ought to be single, must be single. What it does say about a pastor and about an overseer is that he must be the husband of one wife. Amen. What they need today is an infusion of the truth of the Word of God. Amen. This is where I'm going to end today. Because there, there are going to be plenty that's going to hear this. that they, They've been divorced and remarried some more than once or twice. And they're going to feel condemnation. That's not the intent. Because here's what I'm going to tell you. Because I've had to look a man in the face. He, he was sitting there talking to me. He said, you know what? The way, I, the way I left my first wife and got married to my second wife really wasn't the best way. But now me and her, we in church and we getting, you know, think that the Lord's really doing some stuff in our life. We've repented. We trust in Jesus. We've reconciled with the first wife. And I said, well, you know what you need to do? And he looked at me and says, don't tell me I got a divorce. This when to go back to her. I said, no, 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 no. I said, I'm sorry about the first one. I mean, I really don't know what, how you got there. I said, but be faithful where you are. Be all in where you are. Recognize what went wrong in the first one. Avoid those mistakes. And follow the biblical model. Lead, clean. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, I do pray today that you would come and minister to us. Lord, I hold up the Lord to you right off the bat today. I pray that you would help her find relief. I pray that you would just... just Breathe into her today. Or give her relief in this moment. We pray for her healing in Jesus' name. Lord, for all those that will hear this message in the days to come, I pray that uh, not condemnation would come, but the conviction. Lord, and this conviction that you would help us to be faithful where we are today. Lord, I pray that you would help us and cause us to be faithful to our spouse. Faithful to you. And faithful to your cause. I pray blessings over each one here in Jesus' name.